We'd been driving for nearly 18 hours straight, a holiday trip that wasn't planned. Our goal was only about an hour away, and Dad was determined to make it there. But then the roads were closed due to inclement weather. Does the GPS show a different way? He asked. Mom was half asleep, hardly coherent, and he passed me his cell phone. But service was patchy at best. I think we'll just have to call it a night here, Mom muttered as she pointed to a rest stop that some of the 18-wheelers were pulling into. Are you kidding? We are almost there. Dad ignored the road signs and drove off the highway on the curb, going against common sense to get to our destination. It was a gamble that didn't pay off. Ten miles down the road, the weather really was bad, and we couldn't even see the highway. Even he had to call it quits now. Cell phone service is dead. Well, everything is out here, my brother said, peering out across the white wilderness. The air was cold and eerie, making it seem like everything had suddenly frozen in place. But amid the pale frontier, I spotted a motel, or at least the dim lights of their sign. We will have to pull in there. It doesn't look too great, but it's the best we can do, I said. As we got closer, we saw that the building looked abandoned and likely had been for a while. There were broken windows and graffiti, litter everywhere and vines growing in between cracks of the pavement. My brother Marcus was commenting about how this would be the perfect place for a crime. And that prompted Mom and Dad to begin to bicker. This is your fault. We should have just pulled over when we had the chance. At least we would be around other people, she snapped. I thought we could make it, okay? Dad replied. So once again, you go charging into something, not even bothering to worry about consequences. Did you even think for one second about the rest of us? It went on like this for about five minutes until Marcus complained that he was tired. We all were, and it seemed just like that. The fiery conversation was over. Dad pushed a button on his seat to recline it as far as he could and commented, We'll be fine here anyway. No one is going to come out here and bother us. He crossed his arms and closed his eyes all while Mom was giving him another deadly glare. When it was apparent that their argument was over, she told Marcus to reach into the trunk from the middle console and grab some blankets. It's probably going to get pretty cold in here tonight, she advised. It took a little bit of wiggling, but Marcus did as she asked, and about ten minutes later we were as warm as we could be given the circumstances. Outside our little suburban vehicle, the snow kept falling, and it suddenly occurred to me how alone we were out here. It was definitely a very creepy feeling. I wish we could be at Aunt Mel's, I complained. I'm sure they're all worried about us and thinking the same thing, but there's nothing we can do about it now, so let's just rest up, hmm? Mom suggested. I wrapped the blanket tighter around me, trying not to shiver as I closed my eyes. Sleep in this forsaken wasteland wasn't going to be easy. But I realized it also wasn't impossible given how exhausted I was. Gradually, as I watched the gentle snowflakes fall, I closed my eyes and called it a night. But the night wasn't done with me yet. A few hours later, Dad was snoring and Marcus kicked me and muttered, Hey, you awake? I am now, I said groggily as I realized Dad's snoring was probably loud enough to wake the dead. Mom got some earplugs out of the trunk. You think maybe there might be some in this place I can snag? He asked. I looked out toward the dark building, the eerie stillness of it all making me think he was crazy to even consider going out there. It's too dangerous. Could be all kinds of wild animals out at this time of night, I told him. Don't be a chicken. I just want you to watch the door while I run and check. He said as he grabbed his cell phone for a light. He eased his door open and trekked across the snow before I could object. I watched from the car as he crossed over and entered the abandoned motel an overwhelming chill in the air as he disappeared from sight. But this wasn't due to the dropping temperature. I just felt extremely frightened to be in such a place as this. Something could go wrong very easily here, I thought to myself. And then, something did. As I was staring toward the door, trying to catch a glimpse of Marcus, two piercing headlights came over the top of the road that led into the abandoned motel parking lot. Someone else was taking the path less traveled. It occurred to me that someone must pay the electric bill to keep the billboard lit. And that was an odd thought given how isolated we were. I realized as it got closer it was likely due to the heavy snow and the darkness that they couldn't see us and watched as it pulled alongside the abandoned building. 
I heard the soft squeal of tires and then the engine shutting down. I'm not sure how I knew. Maybe it was that strange sixth sense we all get sometimes when we know something bad is going to happen. But I felt it just as the engine died. This driver wasn't supposed to be here. But then again, neither were we. Had they seen us? Probably not given how dark it was outside. So, what were they doing here? I saw a figure jump out of the driver's seat to the snowy parking lot, just a shadow in the blotch of white. Whoever they were, they didn't look like they were lost. They had come here before, I realized. I scanned the store for any sign of Marcus. He was taking too long, I thought. Had he even heard the truck drive up? The driver stepped out of sight near the fuel tanks on the opposite side of the station, just as I spotted Marcus moving out of the front door. I was relieved for a moment as I opened the door in motion for him to hurry. He looked spooked and listened to me, but slipped halfway across the lot and fell face first into the snow. As he did, he shouted at the top of his lungs like he had broken something, and it made Dad jerk up just for a moment and hit the horn on our car. As it blared, I saw the other driver appear out of the corner of my eye, and I froze in place, hoping to God they didn't hear it. I didn't want trouble. I wanted to wake Mom and Dad and hightail it out of here. I shook Mom away because I saw the figure disappear again as she groggily opened her eyes. Dana, what is it? I'm exhausted. There's someone else here, I whispered. Marcus slowly stood up from his slip, wiping blood off his nose as he trekked toward the car. I couldn't see the other driver anywhere. What? What are you talking about? Mom asked as she started to wake up and look around. The storm made it difficult to even see the truck on the other side of the station. Where's your brother? Mom asked, now fully attentive. He had to go use the restroom, I said, pointing toward the portage on. Then I realized I couldn't see my brother anywhere in the icy parking lot. He was here just a second ago, I whispered. What? Enough games, Diana. Where is your brother? Mom asked as she nudged Dad to wake up. Then I realized the other driver was standing right in front of the car. You folks lost, he said. His voice sounded friendly, but the vibe I was getting made me edgy. Dad felt it too as a man approached his window. No, uh, we just wanted to find a place to sleep for the night. Roads are bad, Dad said. The man looked like he had definitely seen better days. His beard was covered in crumbs and his left eye looked like he was going blind. Well, this isn't the place for that. Keep on driving, he advised. Yes, sir, we would be happy to do just that, but our son is using the restroom, Mom commented. Dad checked the parking lot, still no sign of Marcus. The man leaned in a little closer. I could smell alcohol on his breath. Maybe I didn't make myself clear just now. You need to roll on, just the three of you. Leave now before the storm gets worse, the man said. His voice was laced with malice. This wasn't a friendly warning, not even a suggestion. Marcus was going to be left here with him, I realized. But Dad surprised me and stood his ground. I'm not leaving without my son. The driver nodded. Fine, suit yourself, he commented as he walked back across the white parking lot. It seemed like the cold didn't bother him at all. He climbed back into his cab, and as he did, I asked, What do we do? He must have taken Marcus, I commented. I'm going to look for him. Maybe he got lost in the storm, Dad said as he climbed out. I've got a bad feeling about this, Mom whispered as we watched Dad walk across the empty lot. A moment later, the trucker turned on his engine. Was he preparing to leave? Maybe I had misjudged him. He started to rev his motor and kept an eye on Dad. My heart suddenly dripping. No. The driver was about to do the unthinkable. Before I could even react, the 18-wheeler started to drive forward. Mom immediately started to honk the horn, causing Dad to stop in his tracks. Then both of us watched in horror as the truck drove straight toward him. Dad began to run, but the trucker was faster. He pressed down on his accelerator, and we heard the engine roar. He was closing in on Dad. And then Dad slipped, and he was struck by the truck. Even as it happened, I couldn't believe it. I found myself in utter shock, just staring at the parking lot where my dad was now lying in pain, most of his body crushed by the weight of the large vehicle. Then we realized the truck was turning on us. Mom, I whispered. Immediately, she crawled over to the driver's seat and cranked up our engine. 
The trucker was almost on top of us. Then she shifted into reverse and floored it. Oh, God. Oh, God. The 18-wheeler was almost on top of us. Hang on, Mom shouted. We went over the curb, the trucker hit it, and we kept driving even as Mom switched to forward drive and frantically tried to call. Nothing was working. Our cell phone service was hardly working. I could barely see the truck in the distance, but I didn't feel safe. My dad was dead. And who knew what had happened to Marcus? I never saw the truck again, but we did lead the police back to the site after the winter storm. We found Marcus. He was stuffed into the fuel tank where the trucks put the fuel in the ground, along with 13 other bodies, all crushed and crumpled into the toxic fuel to diminish the smell of their corpses. We later discovered the motel sign was on for a purpose, as a drop point for a trafficking ring and depository for corpses. Mom and I will never forget that holiday. I don't know who to blame or who to pray to move on. Not sure I can. I just know somewhere out there a psycho is still on the road. And that's the most frightening thing of all. My family and I are from Australia, and back in 2007, we decided to take a month-long holiday to America. We traveled from L.A. up the West Coast and then back down through Nevada. We did this by renting a car and doing the whole vacation road trip style. One night we were traveling towards Lompoc and stopped in Santa Barbara for the night to sleep. We drove around a while looking for a decently priced motel that wasn't too bring-your-own UV light, if you know what I mean. My mom and dad found a place that looked okay and went inside to inquire about the price of a room for the night while my sister and I stayed in the car and listened to music on our iPods. We were bopping along to the Frey album I had bought that day when my sister removed her headphones and said, Look at mom. What is she doing? I looked up out the window and can see into the reception of the motel and see my dad talking to the manager and my mom displaying very cold and odd body language. She's usually very friendly with staff everywhere, so this was odd for her. What's wrong with her? I said to my sister as we kept a close eye on them. My mom was standing behind my dad with her arms crossed and looking around the place as if she was on guard or something, as if her hypervigilant senses have kicked in. After some time, my mom and dad get back in the car and discuss what to do about staying the night. My dad stated we wouldn't find anywhere cheaper for the night, and he was hungry and ready for dinner. So we better just stay here. Plus, it was the last room available, so we would have to make a quick decision. To his dismay, my mom disagreed. I don't like this place. I have a bad feeling, said my mom. My dad argued on, getting more and more irritated that my mom couldn't explain what she didn't like about the place until my mom finally snaps and yells over my dad saying, We're not staying here! Fine, my dad says as he starts the car and backs out of the military driveway. At this point, my sister and I are looking at each other like, What the just happened? But we stay quiet as mom seems on edge. Anyway, we end up finding a place to stay that mom approved of and bunkered down for the night. In the morning, we are all bustling around the motel room getting ready for the day when my dad turns up the TV to hear a news story about a shooting at the motel my mom didn't want to stay at. Turns out, about 15 minutes after we left, a couple walked in and booked that last room, and the man that was behind them shot them because they took the last room. We all turned to look at my mom who was standing there wide-eyed watching in horror. I told you I had a bad feeling about that place. She said to my dad, who was pretending not to listen. Moral of the story is, always trust your gut, or better, your mom's gut. 